morning, everybody, and welcome to this PhD defense, where Christian Cole will present his thesis titled Characterization and Modeling of Woven Carbon Fiber Prefect Flies for Automated Gradient Processes. Sorry, I had to look at the screen, I should have remembered. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's been supervised by Jeremy Jarvis, Jeremy Stella, uh, over the last three years. Um, we have a procedure. Uh, first, my brief introduction is not going to last ten minutes. Don't worry. Uh, then, Christian will give his lecture. <coughs> this is approximately forty-five minutes. Uh, we try to keep that at a fairly tight time limit. So, I will start raising my eyebrows in a suggestive manner if we exceed 50 minutes. After that, we will have a short break. Some people might want to leave the room. Some people might want to go to the sanitary facilities. <laughs> After that, we will proceed with the questioning by the attentive committee, which I will present. Uh, this is normally approximately one and a half hours, plus minus. We have a maximum for the formal defense of three hours, so we cannot exceed that. After our questioning at the uh, assessment committee, there may be one or two questions ex auditorio that we need to fill in. Uh, if you have a question, um, please contact me in the break. Um, we will prioritize questions from the assessment committee. So in case there's no time, too bad. Take the discussion with the pamphlet after the formal event here. We will take short breaks as needed. The assessment committee is Giordano Bellucci from Alfa Romeo Racing and Turbo Motorsports in Hinwil in Schweiz. Jesper Hassel, professor from TGU and myself. After the formal defense, there will be a small informal reception. The assessment committee will convene in the closed chamber and finalize the assessment document. And we will then <coughs> arrive at the reception and announce our findings. With that, I will give the word to Christian. Please. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so be before we begin with all the fun, I just want to uh, acknowledge a few people. So first of all, there is my supervisor, Johnny Jacobsen. I want to thank him for being a really good companion on this journey. And then there is uh, Professor James Sherwood of the University of Massachusetts Lowell, who was so kind to host my research day. So my PhD has been part of the Flex Draper Research Project. And I want to thank all the guys from the team for being really nice to work together with. <coughs> then I want to thank the assessment committee for <coughs> spending time with my work. And lastly, I want to thank everybody in this room for coming here today. It means a lot to me. So the first thing I want to do is to break down my title for you. And I want to start talking about carbon fiber composites. And as you probably know, they're typically used in really high performance applications. For instance, this beautifully engineered Formula Run race car <laughs> that I randomly chose, but also in some of the larger offshore wind turbine blades, for instance. Another great example is, of course, the aerospace industry. And you will probably agree with me that it's a good idea that the plane is light if it has to do like this. On the other hand, you don't want to compromise the structural integrity. So you want a high strength to weight ratio. And this is exactly what you can get with composites and in particular carbon fiber composites. On top of that, you get a very good corrosion resistance and the fatigue properties are in general also improved. So this typically comes at a more complicated design process and also a more complicated manufacturing. <coughs> and I've been looking into the manufacturing. 
So let's take a closer look at what is actually a composite. And here we talk about laminated composites. And if we go back to that fighter plane from before, and we take out a panel from the wing and zoom into that, we can see that it consists of a number of layers. And each of these layers is called a ply or a lamina. And each ply consists of aligned carbon fiber bundles, which are embedded in a polymer or plastic material. And the plies I've been working with, they actually have two fiber directions because they are woven. And what does it mean that it's woven? Well, it's exactly the same as you can uh, have woven cotton, for instance, that you can use to make shirts. <coughs> or it could be this woven rock. The idea is just it's a means of interlacing the fibers, whether it's carbon or cotton. And then my plies are called pre prick plies. And it means that they are pre-impregnated with the partially cured polymer. And in this state, it's uh, kind of uh, liquid, but very viscous, like very thick. So I think a good comparison would be something like really thick peanut butter. <laughs> so the woven pre prick is kind of the rock with this peanut butter smeared out on top of it. Then there is the actual manufacturing part. So of course, there are a number of steps, but one very important step is the draping. And that means taking the flat fiber plies and then conforming them to the mold. And the mold will, of course, have the same geometry as the part we are trying to make. And as you can see in these photos, it's typically done manually, uh, at least for the aerospace industry. So that is the draping process. So now I think I'm in a little bit, I'm in a, little in a better position now to break down the title for you. And if we start from the back, automated draping processes, it means that we want to make a robot do the draping because it is going to be uh, more cost efficient and it's going to yield parts of higher and more consistent quality. Then there is the material, the woven carbon fiber pre prick ply or the rock with the peanut butter if you prefer that. And then there is my contribution to all this, namely characterization and modeling, which means testing the material and based on the test results, making predictive simulation models, which can assist in this automation task. So the rest of this lecture is going to have three parts. In the introduction, I want to talk a little bit more about the Flex Draper Research Project. And then I want to spend some time discussing why it is so difficult to work with these fibers, fiber plies, and why it's difficult to automate. And then that part will conclude with my research objectives. Then I want to go through highlights of my three journal papers, A, B, and C. And lastly, I want to talk <coughs> about possible future work, including improvements to my ply models, and also something about testing on the robot system. So let's go to the introduction. And what you see here is the Flex Draper robot cell. And more specifically, you see an industrial robot, the Flex Draper tool, the pre prick ply on the tool, and here is the mold where it's going to be draped. So as you can see, the tool consists of a grid of grippers or suction cups, and each gripper can be actuated with this linear actuator. And then there is a combination of joints and links, which enables the grid to passively deform to this mold surface. Now you can see that these grippers move in a specific pattern. They actuate in a specific pattern, and we call that a draping sequence. And the challenge with this system is, of course, to find feasible draping sequences, so that is the gripper movements, uh, such that the quality requirements are met. And what are the quality requirements? Well, let's see how it's not supposed to be done. So first of all, the ply has to match a prescribed boundary. And if you just see this top ply, and I trace the boundary, and then I trace uh, where it's supposed to go, you can see there is this misalignment or offset, uh, and that's of course not, uh, ac ac uh, an ac that's not acceptable. Second, the ply has to conform closely to the mold surface. And that of course means that there will be no wrinkles, which also means that these three areas here are not accepted either. And it's really, really important that these quality requirements are met because otherwise the composite part will lose all of the desired mechanical properties. <coughs> 
And if you were so unfortunate to actually cure a part with these layup defects, you would have to scrap it. And that's very expensive. I know the wind turbine people are a little less strict about this, though. <laughs> Don't worry, it's fine. Now, so I want, to <laughs> I want to talk about why it's difficult to work with these fibers. And I want to start out just with the dry fibers, or dry fiber plies, uh, on the smallest possible length scale. And that's just a single carbon fiber. And it's approximately six micrometers in diameter, so really, really thin. Now, we take several thousands of these fibers and we bundle them to form what is called a toe or a yarn. And then we use these toes to weave into each other, forming uh, a specific weave pattern. And the smallest repeatable unit is called the unit cell. So this weave style is called plain weave. I have been working with satin weave, but that was a little bit more difficult to draw. But anyway, it's the same. It's just a means of interweaving the toes. If we then take all the toes on a macroscopic level, we have the fabric. But it basically means that a fabric behaves very differently from, for instance, isotropic materials, like if you have a rubber sheet. And it means that the deformation of the fabric is highly governed by these underlying length scales. So what does that mean? Now, if we take a single fiber, it's of course very, very stiff in extension. That's why it's nice to put in our aerospace parts. And it also means that a toe is very stiff in extension. But because the fibers are thin and they can move relative to each other inside the toe, the bending stiffness of a toe is not very significant. And, that is, and the same goes, of course, with the fabric bending stiffness. Now, on the unit cell level, the fabric is, under, is uh, able to undergo a deformation called shearing. And as you can see in this illustration, it means that the toes rotate at the crossover <coughs> point, but more or less remain undeformed. But this is maybe a bit idealized. And in reality, you could also imagine some kind of toe slip where the toes uh, will move on the crossover points like this. But this shearing is really, really important for the draping of fabrics. And to illustrate that, I will just take an example with a double curved mold, a double curved surface, as you can see here. And double curved means that it curves in two directions. And then we know from the branch of mathematics called differential geometry that if you have something which is initially flat, like a fiber ply, and it has to go on something that is double curved, like for instance the mold surface, there has to be some kind of in-plane deformation. But you probably already knew this, because this Christmas when you were gift wrapping double curved objects such as footballs or watermelons, you saw that you could not do so without introducing wrinkles. And the reason is, of course, that gift wrapping paper, yes, it can bend out of plane, but it doesn't really deform in plane, okay? If you instead were to wrap your watermelon in this protective packaging net, you can see how nicely it conforms to the surface. And you can even see that that is accomplished by means of shearing. <coughs> Another great example is, of course, when you wear your fishnet stockings on your double curved feet, they also <laughs> tend to shear, as you know. <coughs> so let's complicate things a little bit by adding the resin. Well, there is one good thing about the resin, and that is that it tends to stabilize the fabric. So the toe slip will be diminished a little bit. On the other hand, it does <coughs> increase the stiffness in the other deformations, and for instance, the bending stiffness will increase quite a lot. Then the resin introduces a strain rate dependency. So this is, of course, a typical viscous effect, um, and it means that the force uh, required to deform uh, the, the resin is actually dependent on the rate of deformation. And if we take the peanut butter again, it of course means that if you try to scoop up some peanut butter and you do it slowly, you will see that the force required is lower than if you scoop it up fast. Okay? Then there is the tagginess. <coughs> so when the plies are impregnated with this resin, they are really, really tacky and they tend to stick on the mold if uh, it comes in contact with the mold. Just like peanut butter is tacky. And lastly, there is the temperature dependency. So in the project, we have just been working with the fiber plies at room temperature, but if that was to change, uh, it was something that had to be taken into account. And where do I want to go with all this? Well, there are two things. First of all, it means that the draping operation is not just a pick and place operation. So we need to impose this in-plane deformation during the draping uh, with the robot. And second, all these 
interesting effects with the fabric and the resin has to be accounted for uh, during the modeling and of course also during testing of the material. So this brings me on to my research objectives. And I have been working with this overall research hypothesis, which says numerical analysis can provide quantitative information about automated draping of pre-prick plies in terms of predicting possible defects, as well as feasible draping sequences. And the idea is, of course, that when you work with robots, you, can, you have to program the robot. And one approach is to do manual teaching. And that basically means that you manually move the robot and then record that. You could, for instance, apply a joypad uh, like this, but it's not very efficient and you have to use the robot system. Oh, sorry, you can't use the robot system while doing so. So it's much more efficient to use what is called offline programming, where you use a simulation model to do everything offline and then afterwards transfer the trajectories to the robot. So for my part, in order to predict these possible defects, as well as to generate feasible draping sequences, I have to apply some kind of experimental testing to, test the, to get the, the uh, material properties and then come up with some simulation models of varying complexity that can assist in this offline motion planning. <coughs> so let's go to the results and conclusions from the PhD project. So I've been working with these three papers and the first one, paper A, concerns setting up the numerical framework for planning and simulating <coughs> draping sequences. The next paper concerns examining the shear properties closer. And the third paper, C, concerns draping sequence generation using optimization. And it's maybe going to be a little bit more technical now. And if all you will get was something about peanut butter and fishnet stockings, it's also quite all right. <laughs> so before we go into the actual papers, I will just briefly review some state-of-the-art concepts that will make it a little bit easier to understand. And this one concerns shear testing of the fabric. So there are kind of two tests you can use. Excuse me. The first one is the bias extension test. As you can see, it involves clamping a wide sample of the fabric in these clamps. The fibers are oriented at plus minus 45 degrees to the loading direction. And when you then extend the sample, you get this very distinctive deformation field where ideally there is a pure shear zone in this gauge area marked by the red dashed line. The other test you can do is the picture frame test where you use this rig, which is hinged at the corners and it can impose a pure shear condition on the sample. And again, there is a gauge area here within this red dashed line. So concerning modeling, there are kind of two ways or two strategies you can use. The first is discrete and the second is continuous. So with a discrete approach in the final element method, you would use a grid of beams or bars, which can then be connected with, with the springs or membranes, for instance, to sort of model the discreteness of the problem. And with the continuous approach, you will use membranes or shells to uh, sort of uh, capture all the underlying deformation with uh, homogenized constitutive properties. I also want to mention a special case of the discrete approach, namely the kinematic mapping method. So the idea is still to work with this grid uh, of, of cells, and then in this method, each node can be mapped to the mold under the assumptions of infinite fiber stiffness and zero shear stiffness. So it's a purely kinematic method, but it can be used to predict the draped configuration. So the first paper A is called Modeling the Robotic Manipulation of Woven Carbon Fiber pre prick Plies onto Double Curved Molds, a Path-Dependent Problem. And as I said, the purpose was to set up the numerical framework for planning and simulating draping sequences. And as the title suggests, there is also an aspect <coughs> of trying to investigate this possible path dependency of the problem. And in this paper, I have been working with this virtual draping environment. And the idea is uh, to first use the kinematic mapping algorithm to find the sort of ideal drape configuration on the mold. And based on that, I can also find out where the grippers are supposed to go. 
So this will give me the gripper target point on the mold. The next stage is a motion planning stage. And the idea is to calculate trajectories for each gripper from the initial position to the target point on the mold. And the last stage, transient simulation, concerns checking these generated draping sequences if they will actually fulfill the quality requirements and uh, for that uh, I use the finite element method. Now the main focus of this paper was to set up the finite element model and here you can see the model that I have been working with. So it has a kinematic representation of the actuators and the interlinks and for that I use MPC and connector elements. Then there is the mold surface, which is rid rigid and with a Coulomb friction model. Then there is the actual pre preg ply, which is modeled with a nonlinear rate dependent uh, material model. And for this, I use uh, explicit shell elements. And then there is a rigid representation of the grippers. And in this model, they are tied to the ply, assuming perfect adhesion. So as input to the material model, I used material characterization. So I, I did uniaxial tension tests in the fiber direction. I'd used the bias extension test to get the shear properties. And then there is kind of a trick to get the right bending behavior. Because I used the standard shell elements and the underlying theory assumes that you can get the out of plane properties from just the in plane properties. Uh, and that's of course a little bit tricky when you have non-homogeneous materials. So the trick here is to adjust the compressive stiffness. So uh, not having the same stiffness in tension and compression and fit the compressive stiffness to cantilever test results, you know, bending test results. So this is kind of a trick you can do when modeling fabrics uh, while still using the normal shell elements. Now for the motion planning part, I didn't put that much effort into that actually. The idea was to just to come up with two very simple strategies or sequences and then compare them and see how they performed. And for both of these two sequences, they first move into what we call a pre-shape. <coughs> so the idea is that the grippers move to a position where they have the same set distance to the target points. And then the first sequence is called the uniform sequence. And the idea is now that all grippers will move simultaneously towards the target points on the mold. The second strategy call that the wave shape strategy. And the idea is that the center gripper will lead and then the remaining grippers will follow in this wave shape motion. And if you just play the tape to see how that looks with the actual grippers, you can see this wave shape motion. And the wave shape, of course, doesn't just come out of the blue. It's taken, uh, it has taken inspiration from manual layout where you also tend to choose some starting point and then sort of propagate away from that. And it's a bit like if you were to apply adhesive tape, you would probably also start from one end and then put it down in smaller increments instead of trying to put everything down at once. So with this, I also try to say that the hypothesis was that the wave shape strategy would perform better than the uniform strategy. So let's see some results. To the left, you see my cantilever experiment. And to the right, you can see my simulation I did to verify this uh, material model. And as you can see, it works quite all right. And also from this photo of the deflection versus time, this is a specimen length of 150 millimeters. And it also works all right for a specimen length of 70 millimeters. Here is the results of my bias extension test. And as you can see, the force displacement curve is also traced very well when I simulated it uh, with the finite element me method. And it was <laughs> even able to capture this very distinctive deformation field. This is one rate of 100 millimeters per minute. And I also did two other rates to capture the rate dependency of the material. So let's see how a draping simulation looks like. And as I said, it consists <coughs> of these two uh, stages. First is the pre-shape. And then I'm going to show you the wave shape motion strategy here. The pre-shape and now the wave starting from the center. 
and it's maybe not very easy to see what's going on here. So instead, I will visualize the results as a contour plot of the mole ply difference. So this is a top view of the mold, and it also has the prescribed boundary, which the ply, of course, has to match. And this is the results from a uniform sequence. And as you can see, it's far from perfect. There are wrinkles and air pockets, and the prescribed boundary is not met very well. Now, with the wave shape strategy, the idea was, of course, that it would perform better. And as you can see, it actually does. It still doesn't match the prescribed boundary, but it's improved a little bit. But most importantly, the center region and the lower left corner is now free from wrinkles. So this is at least an indication that the wave shape strategy is probably a little bit better. Right, but it's also uh, very important to mark that none of these strategies should be implemented on the robot system because both of these will of course result in defects. So to conclude on this paper, the kinematic ma mapping algorithm has been a really useful tool for the motion planning part because it can be used to predict where the grippers are supposed to go on the mold. Then I simulated these two strategies, the uniform and the wave shape, and the different results suggest a path-dependent problem because I basically use the same set displacements, just executed in different ways. But this really uh, calls for a more advanced, advanced motion planner and probably also one which can take the ply response into account. So the second paper, B, is called Picture Frame Testing of Woven Prepreg Fabric, an Investigation of Sample Geometry and Shear Angle Acquisition. And the purpose of this paper was to examine the shear properties closer. So it's not going to take us uh, further uh, uh, or closer to a, a better draping sequence. I just wanted to look closer at the shear properties of the material. And in order to understand this paper better, I will just briefly introduce the sort of common test practice for this picture frame test. So first of all, the sample is cruciform, and it has to be cruciform due to the design of the frame, which has to accommodate both the clamping and also the hinges. And second, you assume that the shear angles of the material will follow the frame angles, or you can, for instance, check them using digital image correlation. <coughs> so regarding the first point, I wanted to see if it was possible to modify the arms to see if to if in investigate the effect of, uh, of uh, shear uniformity inside the gauge area. So if these arms would introduce boundary effects of some kind in the gauge area, which is undesirable. This regarding the second point, I wanted to test if we could just capture the shear angles directly by looking at the weave texture. So there is no need for a pattern on the sample. So regarding the sample geometry study, I took the standard cruciform sample and I modified it in two ways. The first one concerned cutting slits in the arms, of course in all four arms, and the second one concerned using ethanol to dissolve the resin in the transverse toes and then by means of a comb and a tweezer to remove the transverse toes in the arms. And that was quite labor intensive, I can tell you. <laughs> Everything for science, right? <laughs> now, regarding the shear angle acquisition, the idea is to take photos of the sample during deformation. And then when analyzing the results, to divide the gauge area into smaller regions. And in each of these smaller regions, apply edge detection and then the Hoff transform algorithm, which can identify straight lines in images. So the idea was that based on this, I could capture the toes and thereby find out the toe angles, which corresponds to the shear angles. So let's see some results. These are some typical deformed samples. And to the left, you see the standard cruciform sample. Then there is the sample with the slitted arms. And lastly, there is the sample with the transverse toes removed. And as you can probably see from the standard sample, it is actually wrinkling, whereas the others are not. So this is the first indication that something is going on with these arms. Now, to the idea was, of course, to check 
the shear uniformity. And uh, by do, uh, in order to do so, I used the digital image correlation method, DIC, because it's well proven. And here you see a result where the frame angle is 18 degrees, and we will of course expect that the shear angles are also in the vicinity of 18 degrees then. And as you can see, they are actually. I mean, there is some boundary effects, um, but it's not that bad actually. Now, if we then take a closer look at the sample with the slitted arms, the idea was, of course, that the shear uniformity would be improved, and mm, maybe, maybe not. It's not very easy to see. Maybe a little bit if you look at the, the histogram next to the color bar. Slightly fewer boundary effects, but it's not very significant. And lastly, there is the sample with the transverse toes removed. And as you can see, it actually made the shear angle distribution inferior and the reason that I identified for this was that these modifications to the sample arms actually made it more difficult to properly install the sample in the frame and also to ensure an even toe tension. But this is the shear uniformity. Another thing is the shear load required to shear the samples. So in this graph, you see the normalized shear force versus the shear angle. And as you can see, with increasing modification of the sample arms, the shear load is actually reduced quite significantly. So because the, the, the average shear angle was actually all right for all of the three samples, I concluded that you get the most accurate shear load results from the sample with the transverse toes removed. And I also backed this conclusion with this graph where I compared the picture frame test and the sample with the transverse toes removed to my bias extension test, recall the test I used in the first paper. And it's of course nice that you can get similar results uh, if you have two methods uh, that you use. So regarding the shear angle acquisition study, here I'm just going to present you the samples, uh, the, slitted, the slitted samples, sorry. <coughs> and the immediate benefit of this approach, as we can see to the left, is that we're actually able to get the shear angles in the undeformed state. So with DIC, you have a pattern and uh, you use the, the reference state as a ref so the initial state as a reference state. But here we can actually get the shear angles in the reference state. And you can see that I was not very good at installing the sample in the frame because even though the frame angle is zero degrees, there is still some shear in the sample. And it also looks to be due to some, some uneven toe tension. Now to the right, you see the result where the frame angle is 18 degrees. And I did not come up with a practical way of doing the Hoff transform and the DSC on the same sample. So, but at least you can appreciate the trend here. The shear angles are in the vicinity of 18 degrees. There are some boundary effects, but all in all, it's, it looks reasonable. And I can just pull up the DIC sample again. Uh, so it at least seems to predict the same trend here. Right, so to conclude on this paper, the shear uniformity is not improved with the sample arm modifications, or at least not with my abilities to install the samples in the frame, but the shear load is greatly <coughs> reduced. Um, and we also saw that the shear angles can be obtained from the weave texture using the Hoff transform. But I have to say, I didn't get these nice results with all my samples. I had some issues with glare from uh, the resin which introduced some noise. And uh, for this reason, uh, it should probably be investigated further how that can be removed. So my last paper, C, is entitled Generation of Feasible Gripper Trajectories in Automated Composite Draping by Means of Optimization. And the purpose is to generate these feasible draping sequences by means of optimization. So the idea is to go back to the issues from the first paper and then, I guess, uh, improve that. So I introduced you the big flex draper robot cell in the beginning of this uh, lecture. Uh, but for this study, I actually used a slightly different robot system. It's called the Minis Draper, uh, and it has been developed here at Albert University 
in parallel with the big flex draper system. The idea is still the same, that you have these uh, grippers, but here the translational degrees of freedom can be controlled for each gripper. <coughs> so this was the reason why I chose this as the basis for my draping sequence generation study. So the idea is to take the ply response into account during draping. So in the first paper, I just prescribed a, more or less a straight line from, from the initial configuration to the final configuration of the gripper. But here we want to take the ply, model in, uh, the ply response into account. And the fine element model can give good predictions, but it's also very, very expensive to compute. So the first step here was to come up with an approximate model, one that can take the gripper positions as input and then predict a displacement field. Now this is going to, or this is put inside a gripper position optimization scheme. So I will choose some optimization criteria, which will bring the ply closer to a draped configuration and I will impose some move limits to make sure that the grippers only move in smaller increments. So the result could look something like this. Now, by iterating over this, which corresponds to iterating in time, eventually the ply will be draped, and these discrete points on the way will constitute its trajectory. So this is the idea, and then I will show you the criteria later. So the approximate model that I've been using is based on cables with bending stiffness. So it comes from a nonlinear differential equation which can be linearized and it has a closed form solution. And that solution depends on the flexural rigidity and also the weight per unit length. It also depends on the reaction force. So basically the cable equation predicts, excuse me, how much cable can be supported by a reaction force. But since we know how much cable there is, I mean how much ply there is, it has to be evaluated numerically. But it's okay, because it's still reasonably fast to do so, and a lot faster than the fine element model. So the way I handle contact is as follows. <coughs> as I said, the grippers will move in smaller increments. And at the end of each increment, it is checked if some portion of the ply is inside a specified contact tolerance. And as you can see here, it's not. But in this next uh, increment, this red part of the ply is now inside the tolerance that will be fixed on the mold. And there is now two independent cable segments and a fixed segment. And this uh, corresponds to a, a perfect adhesion with the mold. So in the first paper, I also used this idea as, uh, of a, uh, a draping sequence as just a, a straight line. So basically a straight line from the initial position to the target point. And as you might remember, it didn't go very well. However, I just want to try this again to see how it works with this approximate model without having too high hopes. So here you can see the ply, the red ply suspended between the three grippers. These here are my three target points. And now I will set it off. So we can see contact is established. But even here, before the grippers have actually reached the target point, I can identify two issues. The first issue is that the ply is not aligned on the mold. So if we take this let left edge, the ply length is actually smaller than the remaining distance to the target point. But the biggest problem is probably here, because there is one contact segment and another contact segment. And in between, there is some free ply which hasn't been draped yet. And this is likely going to result in a wrinkle, which is exactly what we wanted to avoid. I should also mention that this, uh, of course, is in 2D. Um, the model is also in 3D. I just think it's easier to explain this to you in 2D. So the way I will avoid these defects from before, the actual criteria for the optimization, uh, I, can, I can show you here. And at least the basic idea is to first choose a point on the mold, which is going to be the seat point. And then there is a corresponding point on the ply, such that if these two points match, then the ply is aligned on the mold. So the first goal is to minimize this, this, this distance between these two points, such that contact is established. Then after mold contact, the idea is to minimize the difference in angle between the ply and the mold, which will generate this desired wave shape while constraining the grippers, which are further away from the contact front, 
to remain above the mold in order to avoid this issue with multiple contact segments. But it got slightly more elaborate than that. And I will not go through this. I just wanted to show you this. And I wanted to say that some of these criteria are merely here to make uh, the ply behave within its physical limits. And all of these criteria have a uh, physical meaning. And as I promised you, the model is in 3D. So the idea is still to suspend cables between the grippers. And in 3D, there is also cables diagonally across, across the grid. So there are these edge cables and then diagonal cables. So let's see some results. So let's go back to the previous 2D example. Uh, only this time, the trajectories are now generated using optimization. So let's see how that looks. It reaches the seat point. The ply is draped in a wave shape motion. But most importantly, there is only one contact segment existing during the draping. And the grippers reach their target points within a nice tolerance. So the last example I'm going to show you here is a 3D example. And there is this grid of three by two grippers. The mold is both convex and concave. And as you will see, this uh, will give some challenges for this robot system. The seat point is here. And when I play the tape, you can see how the seat point gripper reaches the seat point. And then the ply is draped in this wave shape away from the seat point. The grippers reach the target points. And this blue dashed, dashed line, which is the prescribed boundary, is also matched quite well. There is one issue, though, and that is this part where the mold is concave. So here the ply is actually bridging. It's not in contact with the mold. But this is in the direction of local shear. So, I mean, it's just because the ply hasn't sheared enough. And I think this will be a general problem with these uh, concave molds and uh, this robot system as long as there is not a gripper in this valley. Uh, so, so I guess some thoughts has to be uh, shot after this issue. <coughs> so to conclude on this paper, uh, as I said, there is some issue with this bridging. <coughs> and it could be interesting to maybe look into what we can achieve using debulking or maybe a consoli consolidation roller like this one. So subsequent to the draping process, there can be some uh, debulking or consolidation going on. Otherwise, we saw that the cable model can be used to give quick predictions of the ply displacement field. And together with this optimization scheme, it can generate these desired wave shape trajectories. I mean, the only downside is that, it, that I ended up using so many criteria that it got very complicated. So maybe it could be idea to maybe, you know, step one, go one step back and see if, if things can be simplified a little bit. So uh, lastly here, I just want to briefly go through some potential future work and specifically about how to improve, improve my ply models. So currently the model is elastic, but I have seen that if I shear the fabric beyond a certain degree of shear, it will actually not go back to the original state. So maybe that could be something to take into account. And it will of course depend on what type of um, trajectories um, trying to simulate, but uh, maybe it could come in handy at some point. But I think the most important thing right now for the high fidelity model is to take the ply gripper interface into account. So as I said previously, the current uh, interface model is just perfect adhesion, which means that, for instance, the, the ply cannot slide on the mold. Uh, sorry, on the on the ply, the ply cannot slide on the gripper, and that is of <coughs> course very likely to happen. Um, apart from that, it will also allow the ply to deform locally underneath the gripper, which it cannot do at the moment. And then there's, of course, the question of like 
how all this numerical work will actually work in reality. And uh, it happened that just two weeks before my submission day of my thesis, there was a working prototype of the mini draper ready. So I quickly took the, the tool, I put it on a forklift, and I manually installed the, the ply and did a manual calibration, and I implemented one of my draping sequences from the optimization program. And here is what it looks like. Of course, the seat point is reached as always, and then the ply is draped in this wave shape motion away from the seat point. Yeah, and here you can see that there is an air pocket forming, but I wanted to investigate this consolidation I talked about before, so quickly manually consolidating, it actually, <laughs> <laughs> it actually ended up being fine. So I think this is a really nice example, and it shows the necessity of having a finite element model which can predict these uh, defects even before it's transferred to the robot system. And of course, it looks like sliding is an issue here, so that should of course be taken into account in this finite element model. But maybe this consolidation is not that bad after all, uh, so that should also be investigated further. So I put preliminary here because I want to do it properly with a proper calibration, and, um, but that is of course also something that we have to look into in the project. So the idea is of course that when you detect these flaws in the finite element model, you should automatically be able to go back to the motion planning part, change some settings, and then come up with a new and hopefully improved strategy. And the idea is that the whole loop should be done uh, more or less automatically, so with very little human interaction. So as you can see, we are not quite there, but I hope this will be a step on the way, a contribution towards the uh, automated layup of woven pre quick plies. Thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>